Last week, we did a bunch of experimentation with regular cocktail platforms using the flavor and juice and extracts of various carrot-based ingredients, and you guys really, really seemed to enjoy that video. So much so that one of you, Braden4561, mentioned in the comments that you were interested in seeing a similar video using creme de menthe. Let's go ahead and do that on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael. I am a private events bartender currently available for hire and a home mixologist. And today we are going to be exploring the great wide world of the uses of creme de menthe. This is the first user suggested video uh, that was submitted in the comments of the cocktail carrot cocktail experiments video uh, by Brayden4561. Thank you so much for watching the show and making a suggestion. It's fantastic, I'm so excited. Brayden was telling me in the comments that he has a bottle of creme de menthe he doesn't really know what to do with. So far, he says that all, all he really does with it is make a cocktail called a stinger, which is crazy to me. That cocktail is so old, I didn't think anyone uh, drank them frequently. Like that was their go-to for that ingredient. So we're gonna go through a bunch of different cocktail recipes, um, all of which I've written down here, some of which are original riffs, some are adjustments made to pre-existing cocktails. Uh, each one of them sort of has a different ethos behind it and will hopefully give you, Brayden, a way to use up that bottle of creme de menthe you don't really know what to do with. Before we dive into that though, let's discuss exactly what creme de menthe is because it is not that common an ingredient in cocktails these days. Creme de menthe is a specific kind of liqueur called a creme, which is a very high sugar liqueur. Not a liquor, it's not foolproof, and it's very sweetened on the back end. This is a flavor modifier that combines sweetener and flavorant. This one, if you can't tell by the name, uh, is simply just a mint liqueur. It's very strong and in some cases can come off kind of artificial, but is generally very workable into a lot of different cocktail contexts. Now, there are certain problems with using creme de menthe, and we'll discuss that as we go through these cocktails, but for now, I'm feeling a little thirsty, so let's go ahead and start off on making our first cocktail. Braden had mentioned that he uses the creme de menthe to make stingers, so I'm going to go ahead and start there because I haven't had one in a while, and there's actually some fun stuff we can do with that platform to uh, encourage a little bit of creativity. A stinger is a stirred cocktail, and to start that off, we're going to do two ounces of your preferred brandy. I am using Christian Brothers today. It's not a particularly fancy or expensive brandy, and it's pretty widely available. Um, it's not what I think is best suited here, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it will get the job done. We're going to come behind that with three quarters of an ounce or up to an ounce of white creme de menthe. And that is it. That is the <laughs> entire cocktail. So we're going to go, uh, go ahead and throw some ice into this. For stirred cocktails, I like to crack two large cubes of ice into my glass. And we'll go ahead and stir that until that ice loosens up and uh, the drink is sufficiently chilled and diluted. Now, stingers are meant to be served over a lot of crushed ice. I don't have any crushed ice, so we're gonna fill a rocks glass with some pebble instead. The more you can fit in the glass here, the better, because we want this to stay nice and chilled to sort of embrace the sort of cooling effect of the mint flavor. To finish that off, we'll go ahead and just strain our stinger over that ice. And voila, you have a stinger. Cheers. Man, <laughs> that's old school but it really does work really, really well. There's a sort of a very dry sort of sweetness to it that embraces the notion that the spirit is being modified by the creme de menthe and it's bringing just enough sweetness to make it not a neat pour or an over the rocks pour of brandy. And I can respect that. It's very simple, very approachable, and a good way to end a night of like heavy feasting or uh, or of heavier beers and lagers or very rich and dense wines. This is definitely something that's gonna lighten up your palate and kind of help clear up some of the gross breath they're gonna be having after a nice long feast. When it comes to using creme de menthe, I think the Stinger is actually a really great platform for experimentation because it being only two ingredients means that there's room to add more or room to swap them out. In particular, I think that the issue a lot of people would run into with the Stinger is that they're not gonna be using high quality ingredients and that's of no fault of their own. I mean, even I, for example, am using Christian Brothers Brandy and De Kuiper Creme de Menthe. 
This bottle costs $6. This bottle costs like 15 if fat. These are both very cheap budget options that are not particularly complex, particularly well-made, particularly high quality, etc. ad nauseum. What I'm getting at here is that if you were invested in seeing how these two spirits interact with one another and modify each other, you can swap out different brandies that have different flavor profiles and try those up, or just scale up the quality of your spirits. There are sort of, I guess for lack of a better word, gourmet forms of creme de menthe that you can find on the market, and there are some very, very nice expensive brandies out there with a lot of very rich depth and complexity. If you were looking to try to get through a bottle of creme de menthe and you really enjoyed stingers, that's not a bad way to go. If you weren't invested, though, in trying to upscale your stinger to be something more, I guess, worth drinking, but I don't like phrasing it that way, you could try swapping out the spirit instead. The vodka stinger is a thing, uh, just creme de menthe and vodka in the same proportion, prepared in the same way. You can swap that brandy out for rye whiskey or scotch or mezcal or tequila and see how those flavors interact with each other. And considering that this is actually relatively close to the spec for a Manhattan, just without any bitters, you could very simply add some bitters. For example, I have a bottle of Angostura cocoa bitters here. Just throw two to three dashes of that in there. Give that a light stir just to combine and voila. Yeah, that's great. You've added a layer of complexity to a cocktail that did not have that same layer before, and now are expressing the potential that it has to become something new and interesting that's more, more evocative, more fascinating, more fun to drink, and that's really the whole point. When it comes to the Stinger, great option for using up creme de menthe, actually. Just get playful with it. Try different spirits, try different combinations, scale up the quality of those things, you know, invest in the nicer quality liqueurs and, you know, liquors that you would need to make one and you can have a pretty successful time drinking Stingers. Now, they are very high proof, and they are very, you know, moderated. They're not super dry, but they are pretty close to it. If you were looking for something a bit more sweet or desserty, creme de menthe has you covered. When it comes to the applications of creme de menthe, you are going to find a lot of cocktails that embrace it as a dessert ingredient. It shows up in a lot of dessert cocktails, nightcap cocktails, things that are meant to be the cherry on top of a big meal, or for, for some insane reason, just ridiculously sweet and desserty concepts. One of those is another pre-prohibition cocktail called the Grasshopper, which comes about around about 1918 at the height of the Spanish flu, and it is a combination of green creme de menthe, creme de cacao, and heavy cream. Now, you could do just that, combine those three things into a shaker with some large format ice to froth the heavy cream, shake it till it's chilled, pour it into a coupe, and drink it, and you would have a pretty good time. What you would get is a very delicious and rich and very kind of frothy, if you do it right, uh, cream-based cocktail that tastes like cocoa, or rather chocolate, and mint, and that combination is timeless. Plus, it has a very nice, pleasant green color from which it derives its name. If, though, you were looking to go another step up and get a little crazy with it, the Midwest has you covered because there is a Midwestern-style grasshopper that we're gonna make right now. For a Midwestern-style grasshopper, we're gonna start this off with one and a half ounces of creme de menthe. Now you could go for a green one here, and that would be advisable because that's in the intention is for this to be green. But if you wanted the option to make it green or not, you can always just use a white creme de menthe and one to two drops of green food coloring. We'll come behind that with one and a half ounces of creme de cacao. This is another creme liqueur flavored like chocolate, uh, and it is uh, divine. It is amazing stuff. And then rather than heavy cream, the piece de resistance in a Midwestern style grasshopper is none other than a heaping scoop of the best vanilla ice cream or your preferred vanilla ice cream that you can find. This is Hudsonville Creamery Blend Vanilla Ice Cream. This is the creamiest, smoothest, sweetest vanilla ice cream that I could think of, and it is perfect for this kind of application. For our grasshopper, we're gonna take just a nice big scoop of this. This is an 11 and a, uh, 11 11.7 ounce scoop, I believe. Uh, so a pretty sizable one, and you really just need one nice big scoop like that, and just plop that right into your shaker. <laughs> the idea essentially is that this replaces the heavy cream component and provides 
you know, some additional sweetness and an ancillary flavor in the form of vanilla and a very heavy, dense creaminess that makes the sort of embraces the dessert nature of the cocktail. That's actually all we need to put into our shaker. So we're gonna cap this up, tap it down, and start with a dry shake to get that ice cream to melt and combine with the other two spirits we have set inside. Now that won't take much, so we're just gonna shake this for about 10 seconds or until you can feel that that big, nice blob of ice cream has melted almost all the way. Once we've got our shake complete and that ice cream feels totally dissolved, We'll have successfully chilled the cocktail and brought that creaminess uh, into the mix. But we do still need to shake with some ice. Just like with any cocktail, dilution is an important part of what produces the flavor profile. And in this particular context, we don't want to just throw that out the window and be left with this very, very dense, heavy, just essentially drinking heavy cream kind of texture. We also don't want to over dilute. So what we're going to do instead is what's called a whip shake, which uses very small ice and a very controlled amount to provide just a very light amount of dilution to bring everything together and keep from being too saccharine on the palate. Throw a scotch of pebble into our shaker, cap that back up, tap it back down. <sighs> Doesn't want to seal today. And then we will shake that for 10 to 12 seconds like we normally would, just to let that ice dissolve and kind of bring everything together a little bit. We're gonna crack our shaker back open here. And rather than strain this pour, we're going to just dump this into our glass. I like to serve these particular cocktails long over a lot of very small ice, so we'll pour that on in. And come behind that with a little bit more of our pebble. Get that nice and filled up there. I made just the right amount of ice. Man, that feels great. <laughs> With a cocktail like this, if you're gonna put dairy alongside ice, you really wanna go heavy, 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 heavy on the ice because you do not want the, it to melt too fast and provide too much dilution. That's just gonna make it taste gross. That is a Midwestern style grasshopper, sans green color. I'm gonna grab a straw, put that down in there and give that a nice big sip. Cheers. Ooh, yes, that's nice. Uh, so the thing about cremes is that they may be very high in uh, sugar, but some of them are actually reasonably high proof, at least for liqueurs. In this particular case, the Dequempa Creme de Menthe is actually 60 proof, 30% alcohol by volume, which is higher than a lot of other liqueurs, especially in this category. What that means is that this cocktail does have some length to it. There is still the presence of alcohol noticeable on the palate, and it really does actually, as a sensational note, play well with the combo of chocolate and vanilla and cream. It's it's lively, it feels, it feels very present and loud and, and proud and enjoyable. And that's kind of the point with Creme de Menthe in a lot of contexts. It should be something you can detect to some extent and maybe not necessarily intensely every single time, but it should be something that is proud and in charge and accompanied by flavors that are really, really nice. I do like the way this tastes. I love the combo of mint and chocolate and you know, throwing ice cream in there is always a big plus, but um, it is really, really sweet. If you wanted to pull that back, I have actually tried this myself. Coffee bitters is a great way to do it. The combination of coffee, vanilla ice cream, chocolate, and mint is delectable. It works so, so well. And it does help moderate some of that sort of heavy sweetness and, and make it a little bit more palatable if you're gonna have more than one especially. But if you're really just trying to savor it slowly and not be too invested in wolfing it down. I can't, it can't be stated enough that it is super important that you use a high quality ice cream here. That makes up the vast majority of the base of the cocktail. So the nicer that that is, the more successful you're going to be in producing a cocktail that is round and full bodied and interesting, despite relying on relatively uncomplicated ingredients, which is always nice. Now, so far we have covered two different kinds of dessert cocktails, which is a lot of what creme de menthe is used for, but it can stand to exist in a savory context, especially if you were considering it as a replacement for mint. Now, there's not very many cocktails that use mint that you would think, oh yeah, creme de menthe is a really good replacer for. But I would say the two that come to mind are a mint julep, especially if you're going to make it in the hailstorm style, which I have a whole video on the inventor of the mint julep named John Dabney, which you can watch up here. I totally suggest you check that out. But rather than do that a potential misjustice and make a mint julep that way, I'd actually rather go for something that people are a little bit more invested in, a mojito. 
Now, a mojito is a sort of, I suppose, a rum Collins, you can look at it, favoring the flavors of lime and mint. Uh, and there is a way to do that using just creme de menthe, but you have to understand that even when we're talking about high quality forms of the spirit, we are going to encounter the issue of it not tasting the same way as fresh mint does sort of artificial nature of how liqueurs are made means that that mint flavor is going to be more synthetic and as a result we're going to have to modify the way we make our mojito ever so slightly and I will walk you through every step of that process. To begin I'm going to start with just a very very small amount of simple syrup. Uh, anywhere up to uh, a quarter of an ounce I am going to, up to a half an ounce I'm gonna go for about a third of an ounce today. Even though cremes have a lot of sugar in them creme de menthe is tying its sugar to its mint flavor. So we do not want to overdo it to compensate for a lack of sugar in the drink entirely. The first time I tried it this way, it was actually surprisingly dry. It did need a very small amount of sugar just to tie everything together. So this will allow the mint flavor to be loud, proud, and bold without having to do too much legwork to combat the lime that we will inevitably be putting into it. We'll come behind that with a full ounce of creme de menthe. Next up, we need to address our lime component, and I think this is one of those important places where we're gonna need to make a slight change. While we could simply juice the lime and use that in the cocktail like you would with a regular mojito, a lot of mojitos are actually muddled, which allows you to express the lime and the, the juice out of the lime, rather, and the oils out of the mint simultaneously. But because we don't need to muddle any mint, it seems a little silly to do that, unless we wanted to introduce some of that complexity again. There's a lot of flavor in citrus peels in the form of oils that the citrus fruit itself carries. And you get a nice three-dimensional flavor if you include that in your cocktail, which isn't always the case if you simply juice it. So we're instead going to muddle this drink with the lime to produce that juice component, kind of like how you would for a caipirinha or a caipirosca. I'm gonna take a full lime here. I'm gonna cut off the ends and split it into four quarters. I'm gonna take this strip of white flesh off the center of the lime. That's called the pith. It carries a lot of bitterness and we don't want too much of that in our cocktail. We're already going to be encountering a good amount from the lime oils and the peel, so we don't wanna overdo that. The pith removed, we'll just drop all four pieces of lime directly into the shaker and then we're good to move on to our next ingredient. Traditionally speaking, a mojito should be made with a Cuban rum or a more mild and careful rum that is gentle and allows the lime and the mint to play sort of the predominant roles in the flavor. But because we're dealing with a mint substitute that is not particularly complicated, I think a blended rum is going to be a better option here. Now that can include a Cuban, but it should also include something with a bit more character, like a Jamaican or a Dominican, something that has a little bit of funk to it, or something that is a little bit more smooth and rolling with some good evolution. My preferred rum is Two Ports Rum, which is a blend of a Dominican and a Jamaican, and in this context, I think it works fantastic. This already makes really good daiquiris, so it's a pretty good substitute for uh, a mojito. In this particular case, it's exactly what we need to make the drink, you know, palatable and well balanced. Lastly, I'm going to make one more very simple addition, a single dash of Angostura bitters. This might not seem like a big component here, and it's definitely not normal for a mojito, but what this is going to do is introduce some complexity to the flavor that will introduce some botanical and spice similarity uh, and sort of play off of that mint to give us a more full evolution that leans away from being too sickly sweet, moderating the sweetness and helping expand the flavor. One is more than enough, by the way. Don't go more than one, because then you'll mess with the color as well as adjust the flavor towards the Angostura. It's a very strong ingredient, you just need the one dash. That's our cocktail complete. I'm gonna muddle this down to get that lime juice and oils expressed out of those pieces. And then we'll commit to a traditional shake with one whole cube of ice and one large cube of ice cracked. We'll cap that up, tap that down, and shake for 10 to 12 seconds, chill and combine. We grab a highball glass for this, as well as a strainer, and we're gonna catch all of the pulp and pieces of lime out of this. We don't want those floating in the cocktail. Before we cut this back with some soda water, we're gonna take some ice and fill it up to a respectable wash line. About there looks good to me. And to cap that off, we will just top that up with some soda water. And there you have what I refer to very affectionately, mind you, as a poor man's mojito. <laughs> And then just a gentle stir up and down just to make sure those are combined. And then we'll go ahead and give that a taste. Cheers.
Yeah, that is not bad. <laughs> the one thing that it is missing from a traditional mojito is the sort of, ver not veracity, but intensity of uh, the oils in mint. Fresh mint is fresh mint. There's really not a substitute for it, but that creme de menthe is giving you just enough of that sort of light, you know, brightening, chilling sweetness behind the flavor of the rum and the lime, which are both very diverse and fun and playing off of each other very, very well uh, to make it read like a mojito. And while you're not necessarily tasting Angostura bitters by itself, you know, that very particular baking spice flavor, it is giving character to the interaction. And I think providing a sort of another common note off of which both the rum and the lime and the mint can play successfully. It's very light, very moderately sweet, you know, nothing too intense. I think it's right where it needs to be for most people and something that you could definitely sip on all day, especially this week, which has been particularly hot for whatever reason. For sure, I think the use of a blended rum of some kind is a necessity. I'm getting the complexity of both the Dominican flavors and the Jamaican flavors, and it's giving the, the cocktail a lot more uh, body and interaction and evolution, which is really important when you're dealing with a simplified ingredient like creme de menthe. Perfect way to apply it in a savory context right there. So thus far, we've discussed a couple different, you know, classical and then modern ways to do a dessert cocktail featuring creme de menthe, and one way to do it in a savory context as a substitute refreshment. What about if you wanted to experience a new spirit? How about if we were to use that as a common, you know, base plate off of which to try something new? Allow me to introduce you to a cocktail I came up with called a last box, and I'll explain that in just a moment. <laughs> this is going to be a shaken cocktail and one that uh, should not have any leftover lime pulp in it. So hold on a second. <laughs> the last box was a uh, an idea I came up with just tasting out and testing flavors and seeing in what contexts creme de menthe screams at its highest potential. It just hits that perfect high C so well. And this is absolutely one of them. To start, I'm gonna reach for some cold brew concentrate. This is one part uh, ground coffee, uh, four parts water rested for 24 hours in the fridge. Uh, that creates a concentrate that's good for about two weeks and we need one ounce of it. Alternatively, if you have an espresso machine, you can actually go for uh, espresso here instead. It does about the same thing. They're you know similar in their flavor complexity, but there's more smoothness and roundness to cold brew than there is espresso. So if you're looking for something a little bit more volatile and that will give you a head on the cocktail, espresso. If you're looking for something easier that does not require special, you know, uh, special tools to produce uh, and something that you could probably just drink on its own, cold brew concentrate. Next up, I'm gonna do one ounce of our good old pal creme de menthe. We'll come behind that with one ounce of our creme de cacao. Finally, the star of the show, for which there may or may not be a substitute, Linny Aquavit. This appeared in the video on the Tunnel Vision and the Death & Co bars in New York and all over the United States, which you can watch up here at the link in the top right corner. Uh, this is a, an Aquavit aged in oak sherry barrels uh, that apparently crosses the equator twice. And what effect that has on the flavor, I don't know. Or rather, effect on quality, I guess? I don't know. It's uh, a very, you know, star anise and caraway forward aquavit that's been sort of subtled by the rich, you know, vanilla, honey, oaky notes of the barrels and a nice light hint of sherry. This is absolutely something you need, uh, but if you can only find a regular aquavit, so long as it's not dill flavored, you're good to go. One ounce. That is our full cocktail there, so we're gonna go ahead and add some ice to that. As always, we'll do one cube whole and one cube cracked. We'll go ahead and cap that up, tap that down, and shake for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. We're gonna serve this up in a coupe, and because there's no pulp or anything we have to catch, aside from maybe some very small chips of ice, we're just gonna go ahead and straight pour this into a coupe. Assuming I can get this cobbler shaker to unseal on me, oh my god. What the, what is, what? What the H? There we go. Now, was that so hard? Pour that right on it. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a cocktail of my own creation that I call The Last Box. Let's go ahead and give it a sip. Cheers. Oh, yes. <laughs> ah.
So the name The Last Box comes from the notion of Girl Scout cookies. And I think if you look at this combination of flavors, you could probably detect exactly why I called it that. The Last Box tastes shockingly like Thin Mints, very remarkably similar. And while it's not exactly the same, there's a lot of herbal complexity going on in the background here, giving the, you know, the rest of the flavors a very nice base off of which to play. That is the closest comparison I could find, and it tastes absolutely delicious. The mint and the chocolate liqueurs are giving it a nice balanced sweetness as they would in, you know, as two liqueurs would in any last word variation com, you know, context. That sort of rich and dark and bitter cold brew concentrate is giving it this nice moderation and a necessary amount of acidity because coffee is lightly acidic, less acidic than citrus, but still acidic. <laughs> and that aquavit underneath is bringing these nice, warm oak notes, but also this very fascinating botanical uh, sort of uh, kind of bass note off of which everything is playing. And it reads like this just delicious, light, refreshing, gently sweet, but moderated and firmly rich flavor. Oh my God, I love this drink. <laughs> it definitely toes the line between dessert and savory. It's something you could sip at any time of day when you would have a cocktail otherwise. And the unique base spirit is the important part of that because it's what gives the, you know, the cocktail its backbone. If you were looking to try something, a new spirit or a spirit you're not familiar with in a context that uses creme de menthe, Something like this kind of spec would be good. And in fact, I think most spirits would work well in this exact context as a substitute for the aquavit. Especially uh, rye, I think, I think rye would be great. I think scotch would work weird, but cool. Uh, I think gin might even work here, which would be fascinating because usually that's a little bit lighter and more citrusy. So who knows how that would play out. It's a really, truly great combination. And I mean, coffee, chocolate, mint, Almost anything else is gonna work with that combo because it's so strong, but the Aquavit here is playing such a key role in diversifying those flavors and giving them evolution and character that it cannot be understated how worth it is to try this if you were looking for something to expand your palate and experience mixology in a sort of inventive way. Okay, so thus far we've discussed two ways to do creme de menthe in a dessert context. One way to substitute it for a savory cocktail, a cocktail that toes the line and allows you to experience something new you haven't tried before. And now I'm just gonna throw some shit at the wall and see what motherfucking sticks. Pure mixological experimentation. You see, I find mints to be comparable to other botanicals like what you would find in gin or aquavit or even vermouths per se. Technically speaking, it's an herb, but like most things that appear in some, especially esoteric gins like thyme or, or various citrus peels or, or spices and things, it's in the same family. And I think that there is a way to embrace that in a really weird and stupid way. So let's just make a really weird gin sour that I, th I think I'm gonna have to explain as I add each ingredient to the shaker. So. Hear me out, okay? This is gonna be, this is gonna take a turn at some point and you're gonna think I'm an idiot, but hear me out. <laughs> to start, we're going to need two ounces of a gin, preferably of a London Dry category. I'm going to use Gun Room 12 Botanicals, which is a pretty round, robust, full body gin uh, at a pretty reasonable price point, at least where I am, because I can get it. Clearly the other four cocktails that may or may not be visible in shot are starting to hit. I'm feeling a little loose. The gin is going to give us a base off of which we can play that favors botanicals. So something that uh, a lot of other flavors can modify and be given complexity by. And we're going to come behind that with some lime juice. Excuse me, I'm stupid. I meant lemon. Lemon juice is going to give us an obvious amount of, you know, citric acid off of which we can balance some sweetening modifiers. Uh, not just our creme de menthe in this case, but also another ingredient that we have yet to see thus far and one that I'm actually experimenting with in this context for the first time. I have not had this cocktail before, but what I am making for you right now. Um, this is as much an experimentation as for you as it is for me. So one ounce of lemon juice. The gin is giving us a base level of botanical complexity. The lemon is giving us acid and a complimentary bright uh, sort of 
shocking, you know, tart flavor off of which we can throw some other, you know, flavors. I'm going to lean into both of those things by leaning into a Blanc Vermouth, specifically Lillet. Lillet Blanc is a very, I would say florally forward uh, Blanc Vermouth, as a lot of them tend to be, and one that does have a sort of citrus lemon peel note to it, uh, mixed in with the remainder. It's a fascinating vermouth, and on its own, I think, has the potential to do really great things. But in this case, I wanted to give context to both the lemon and the gin and pull it towards the notion that we are trying to lean into botanicals uh, so that when we add our mint component, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. That's really the whole, I'm building a framework upon which I think the mint can stand. Half an ounce of Lillet Blanc. And uh, is it a sin to throw vermouth into a shaken cocktail? Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, vermouths are fortified wines. They don't handle oxidization well. A lot of oxygen gets added to cocktails when you shake them this way. Uh, but hey, we're, like I said, balls to the wall, man. Seeing if they stick. If your balls stick to the wall, please go see a doctor. <laughs> Finally, half an ounce of our signature ingredient, creme de menthe. Uh, in this case, actually, I would say go for a green one if you can, uh, because it would really, really throw people off if you hand them a gin cocktail that is a fluorescent green. Um, and with such an odd botanical bouquet to, to experience, I think that would be a lot of fun. I, uh, like I said, I've never put these ingredients together this way, so. Oh. Okay, you know what? That doesn't smell bad. Um, hold on, let me just do a quick. One moment. I'm going to add um, just a bar spoon of simple syrup because that acid is a little loud and I think there's just barely not enough sweetness between the vermouth and the um, creme de menthe to make this balanced. That should pull it together. We're gonna do our usual one cube hole and one cube cracked, as always, for shaken cocktails. That one was ready to break. That was intense. That was fun. Man, I love this job. Tap that up, tap it down, down, <laughs> and shake for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. Gonna grab another coop here, Let's pour that into that. That is covered in water spots, oh my god. What? Okay, problem solved. <laughs> I'm a stickler for some details, that's one of them. Gonna grab a cocktail strainer here and just pour this right on into that coop. In this particular case, assuming this drink is worth existing in the first place, a garnish of both mint and a lime w uh, peel would be pretty great. But let's find out if it deserves to exist in the first place. Cheers. You know, funnily enough, I think the one thing that doesn't belong here is the vermouth. <laughs> Lillet Blanc is such a complex flavor. It's really standing out from the rest of what's going on. I think there's enough botanical complexity in the gin by itself to stand up on its own, especially if you're using a juniper forward gin like Beef Eater or Tanqueray or Bombay Sapphire. That's gonna be enough to stand up against um, lemon and mint. And frankly, those three combine together really well. There's not really, as it turns out, the need for any more botanical complexity, but it's not necessarily unwelcome. It sort of pulls it towards the direction of a uh, Italian style lemonade, where there's a kind of rich herbalness to the flavor of the lemon somehow. And, and it just, like a San Pellegrino, it tastes a lot like that. Well, not like that, but similar to that. The lemon and the mint are playing together really nicely. I mean, and that's saying something because the mint's not very loud. I think we've kind of muted it accidentally by sort of putting it alongside two very loud flavor players, the gin and the vermouth, I think, in particular. It's kind of pulling it back. Um, and we only half an ounce in there. There's not really a ton of uh, that sort of impactful mint flavor to go off of. Really, I think the solution here is take the vermouth out, do a full ounce of creme de menthe, and then a bar spoon of simple syrup just to round it out. And you'd have something pretty fascinating on your hands that would work pretty well. Or maybe, hey, maybe even muddle the the lemon like you would a whiskey sour or a whiskey uh, smash. That will give you some nice three-dimensional character. We're playing with ideas here. And I mean, that's the whole point. This particular cocktail is meant to express that even ingredients you would not expect to function the way that they do, uh, <laughs> it, uh, still can be used in contexts where you would not anticipate they would succeed because you won't know until you try. So why not give it a shot?
So what is the takeaway from all of this? I think each and every one of the cocktails that we made today expresses a different capability in terms of mixological technique as it relates to creme de menthe. The classics provide a really great backbone off of which we can attempt to make new things, especially by adding ingredients that did not exist at the time or were not available at the time to simply experiment with and can give us really great freedom to create something that we enjoy. More modern schools of thought can take the classics that already exist and make them better, or at the very least different, uh, and maybe more to your palate, by substituting one ingredient for another and simply rocking with the good old fashioned, don't, if it ain't fixed, don't broke it. That's that sentence, wow. In the same way that we can rely on old school techniques with the same ingredients, we can actually substitute newer, fresh ingredients with the correct care given to the overall composition of the cocktail to make savory components work when we typically think of a spirit as desserty or not necessarily capable of replacing a fresh ingredient like fresh mint. Furthermore, interesting liqueurs like creme de menthe can be used as a familiar flavor off of which to experience new things that you have never tried before, as was the case in the last box, which uh, I'm gonna say right now, easy favorite. <laughs> And even if we are experimenting with new concepts and ideas, something like Corn can still be very, very useful in the sense that it gives us an idea of how flavors relate to each other and how composition can be modified using some very simple adjustments to traditional schools of thought. All that said, uh, obviously I'm a huge fan of the last box and this weird balls to the wall sour that I made uh, because these are both, uh, this one is weird as fuck and this one is just really, really good. So obviously those are the best. The mojito uh, is the objectively, I think, the worst because for the you know what actually fuck that. Never mind. All of these are worth experimenting with. Every single one of the concepts in this video, I think, is worth experimenting with because you have the old school, dry, basic, simple about the technique preparation of a spirit type thing. You have a modern variation on an old school thought that gives you a new delineation of character. You have something creative in every way, shape, and form. Give it all a shot. Really, for you, Brayden, and anyone who else who is watching this video, this is intended to be a notion that anything is possible when it comes to spirits and combining them in ways that are worth trying, worth drinking, worth enjoying, worth imbibing. Everything here on this counter, I think, has at least some reason to exist. Out of necessity, because you can't get fresh ingredients, out of experimentation because you want to expand your palate out of experimentation because you just have a really fucking weird idea you want to try. Every one of these has a reason to exist and they are all worth giving a shot to because you won't know until you try. And frankly, Crown de Menthe is probably the you don't know until you try of liqueurs anyway. I think a lot of people would consider it a black sheep of the liqueur families, especially of the cremes, uh, up there with creme de violet, just because of how difficult it can be to moderate or use correctly. But given the right amount of respect and intrigue and attempts and time to develop the ways it can be used appropriately, creme de menthe can be an ingredient that you can enjoy in nearly any context with nearly any companion flavors. So, Brayden, hopefully this answers your question on how to help you get rid of that bottle of carbon meth you don't really know what to do with, because I am, I am loosened up, that's for sure. And it's getting warmer in here by the second because I have to turn my AC off when I film, so we're calling it there. <laughs> As always, to cap off the end of every episode, we're going to do a reading from our book, Crisp Toast by Andrew Frothingham and William Evans. That really hurt my hand, ow. The last time we read from uh, Crisp Toast, we were reading from the action section. And I do believe we had a surprisingly uh, modern quote at the time. Today's quote, which I saw toast to all of you with this Midwestern style grasshopper, reads as thus. The harder you work, the luckier you get. A quote attributed to one Gary Player. Cheers to all of you, and to Mr. Player. Thank you all so much for watching another episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. Um, I was really excited to do this one because you guys really enjoyed the carrot, you know, the carrot and cocktail experiments video that came out last week, which I've mentioned once before and might have already appeared in a card up in the top right. But if it hasn't, it's appearing now. Go ahead and click that button to watch that one. I think it's a really fascinating, you know, idea to explore mixological concepts, just as this one was. And hopefully you guys all learned something out of what you saw here today. 
Uh, if you want to catch the next episode of the show, they come out every single Friday. And if you want to be informed of when that happens, you can go ahead and click that subscribe button down below and the bell notification next to it. So you get a nice good old fashioned notification when the next video comes up. Follow me on my socials that are either appearing on the screen now or have been on the screen for a moment. I use TikTok and Instagram the most aside from YouTube, and you can find different posts about the cocktails I make on the show or ex weird experiments I'm doing in my personal life or cool bars I go to, all there, all that good stuff. Thank you all again so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you guys on the next episode of Mike's Heart Reviews, and uh, remember to please drink responsibly. I'll see you all on the next episode. Bye-bye.